the world most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Colonel Ansel Talbert, one of the editors of the New York Herald Tribune, and Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Henry Wallace, former Vice President of the United States. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Wallace, you, of course, are one of the most controversial political figures of our time. And I believe one of the most controversial points uh, that you've ever advocated was uh, American spending, large-scale American spending abroad. Now, when did you begin advocating this program, sir? Sometime in 1941, and in a rather extensive way, in 1942. And you, you were a real pioneer in that field. You were one of the first Americans to so advocate that spending, weren't you? I was so recognized at that time. And uh, you were bitterly uh, assailed. I believe that was referred to as global only and as uh, the building of uh, TVAs on the Danube and other such... Uh, Milk for Hottentots and so forth. I'm very proud of the names that were called at that time because uh, those names caused the people really to remember that I stood for a what is now looked on increasingly as a very enlightened program. Well, now, that's been, it's been 10 years now since you began that advocacy, sir. And tonight, I'm sure that our chronoscope audience would like to know exactly where, what you think now about that program. And specifically, uh, what do you regard as the most critical er areas in the world today? Well, today, the most critical areas, in my opinion, comprise the Mohammedan world, extending from French Morocco on the west, all the way across to uh, the southern part of the Philippines, and including also the Hindu world, and in addition, I would say, uh, South Korea, because it seems to me of absolutely vital importance if we wish to gain the sympathy of the peoples of Asia and the Near East that we do a real job for the South Koreans as soon as the war comes to an end. If we don't do that real job to rehabilitate them, we will lose face even more decisively than we would lose if we lost the war in Korea. Well, Mr. Wallace, do you think the American people have gotten their money's worth out of this spending? Uh, which spending are you referring to, sir? The uh, foreign aid, which has been extended rather lavishly in the past eight or nine years. Are you referring particularly to the Marshall Plan aid yes. in, in Europe? Then? And well, I think undoubtedly there have been some uh, waste motion in <laughs> the expenditure of the Marshall Plan aid, but it uh, would seem to me to have contributed maybe 20% uh, well, to the increase in production that has taken place. That's a rough figure, but it's uh, brought about a very substantial increase. Yeah. Now, How about our armaments program, Mr. Wallace? Uh, you've been called a man of peace. Uh, do you think our current armaments program is justified and the cost uh, which it is imposing on the American people? Well, the situation as it has developed, and I regret that it developed in this way, and I don't think it need to have developed in this way, but with it having developed in this way, we did have to go ahead with a very substantial armaments program. My contention today is uh, that we take perhaps 1% of this... Uh, oncoming armaments program of perhaps $60 billion a year and uh, devote that 1% uh, to a peace budget. I think we ought to have a peace budget going along with our war budget and the peace budget gradually growing stronger as the war budget can be reduced. Now, sir, you have said that the critical areas are the areas around the Iron Curtain, particularly the displaced Arabs, 
And uh, what would you have us do now, sir, in those critical areas, specifically in, in, in for the displaced Arabs? Well, this, this uh, report of the committee that was recently made seemed to me to be singularly enlightened. Uh, first, of course, there are the immediate needs of these displaced Arabs, but far more important than that, the long-time needs, which have to do with the resettlement of these Arabs uh, by providing adequate irrigation in that part of the world which at one time had the most significant irrigation systems in the entire world. Now, in the Tigris-Euphrates River Valleys, you remember that uh, Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees, I suppose somewhere in Iraq, it was a marvelously fertile, civilized area at one time and can be made so again. And these displaced Arabs, if we will step in decisively and vigorously to help them, uh, uh, can do a genuine job. And in the process of doing that also, uh, we can make the position of Israel more tenable. Now, do you advocate this, sir, purely for humanitarian motivations? No, not purely for humanitarian, although I have observed this, that uh, pure humanitarianism always has its economic aspects. Genuine humanitarianism pays. Well, it pays now, how, big how in the can long it, run. How can it pay the United States uh, other than just doing a good turn if we step in there and help those people to a higher standard of living? Can it help us in our war against communism? Definitely. It makes all the difference in the world in our war against communism uh, to show that we can do for them what communism cannot do. The communists always promise land. Of course, actually, the, after the land has been given, they'll charge a higher rent than was formerly charged by the landlords. We can do a real job in seeing that these displaced Arabs have land, working in cooperation with the respective governments, seeing that they have uh, the dams are constructed, mm -hmm. irrigation canals uh, dug, uh, water made available, always having the local government, however, contribute its part as well. And most of these governments do mm -hmm. have income because of oil. Do you, if we do that for them, do you think that will make them prefer us to what Russia has to offer? If we really understand them, if we develop an extension system in their terms, similar to the extension system which we learned how to develop for our farmers in their terms. How about the Far Eastern situation, Mr. Wallace? Can we do anything in the Far East until we have stabilized the military situation? In the Far East? In the Far East and Korea, for example. No, we first have to uh, wind up this Korean War, and uh, I realize that that is a difficult problem, but I think that's off to one side. I wouldn't care to get in on that. I merely want to say that after the war is over, uh, that we should start on a very vigorous peace offensive in Korea, that is, by a peace offensive, doing a real job for the Korean farmers. Now, Mr. Norman Thomas on this show recently said that as um, soon as peace comes, we must step up uh, government expenditures, uh, even larger expenditures, more taxes than we are now levying. Now, do you share that view, sir? Do you believe that we should have more taxes, more government money, and then uh, an equal amount spent uh, to what we are now spending for military activities? I would want this peace budget to come in as a part of the reduction of the military budget, but with the total budget being, of all kinds, being less and less. Now, I realize that that may be difficult as long as the world is in crisis, and I don't think anyone can make an absolute statement as to just what percentage of our income can be spent on taxes and our capitalistic economy survive. I don't think anybody can state that with any finality. It depends on the crisis and the temper of the people. If the people feel that they're in very grave danger, then the changes can be, then the uh, taxes can be borne. But uh, I certainly would hope that we could have a much pro smaller proportion of our income going for taxes than at the present time. Well, Mr. Wallace, uh, you've been, we've been discussing what we might do when peace comes. How does the situation for peace look to you right now? Peace in Korea, some sort of settlement with the communists in Russia? I don't think anyone can say right now. It doesn't look very hopeful, does it? Well, I, I have this feeling that uh, in this kind of a situation that the situation is most hopeful when it looks least hopeful. Mr. Mr. Wallace, as a final question, sir, 
You've always been a man who your critics uh, conceded uh, wished mankind well. And at the end of the year, we'd like to know, and our audience would like to know, if you see anything hopeful for 1952, sir. Yes, I see a great eagle that is hopeful as we come to the end of this year. I believe the people of the United States are closer to facing the real facts, that force is not the ultimate arbiter, that ideas are the ultimate arbiter, that there is such a thing as carrying out the ideals of Jesus, that you can go forth into all the world and preach the gospel, the gospel of what a real democracy means, the gospel to every living creature, that uh, Jesus did come that we might all have life and have it more abundantly, and that that can be implemented with what we have, and that that ideal, which means so much to humanity, cannot be carried out with what the communists have, but with what we have, if we really mean it, if we put our technology to work in that spirit in an understanding way in terms of these people that are producing only one twentieth as much as we're producing, who want to enjoy the good things of life, who have a right to the good things of life, and can produce twice as much within 10 years as they're producing today. Well, sir, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates your views tonight, and thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Colonel Ansel Talbot and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Henry Wallace, former Vice President of the United States. On February 15th, at the Bislett Stadium in Oslo, Norway, as the Olympic flag is raised, King Hawken will officially open the Winter Games of the 1952 Olympics. And the exclusive official watch for these Winter Olympics will be Longines, the world's most honored watch. The watch employed will be the world-famous Longines Olympic Timer which registers to a tenth or a fifth of a second, and which are of traditional Longines split-second accuracy. Supplementing these Longines watches will be new timing devices recently developed in the Longines Research Laboratory and made in the Longines Factory, devices which will register the time to the one hundredth of a second with the greatest accuracy ever attained. And may I repeat that all Longines watches and timing equipment which will be used during the 1952 Winter Olympics, are Longines conceived, Longines designed, and Longines made, a fact not true of many timepieces in this world of today. Here in the Winter Olympics is another honor for the world's most honored watch, Longines, the only watch ever to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors for accuracy from national observatories. And the experience gained in creating watches of high precision for scientific purposes contributes to the perfection of all Longines watches. And that's why throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight again, inviting you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines with Noah Watchers. This is the CBS Television Network.